signal characteristic, they always go through space a little bit at a time. You cannot show me a signal which doesn't do this. So we say signals are local signals. They always go to the locality before they can go to a faraway place. Local signal for principle of locality. Communication can only occur by taking the information a little bit to space, a little bit with a little time, and that's how it works. Since the great Isaac Newton, this is the way we have been taught. This is part and parcel of scientific materialism. Why is God absurd in scientific materialism? How does God communicate with the world? Where is the signal? Show me the signal. And the spiritualists say, oh, I don't know, there is no signal. Look, God is not like that. God is beyond all signals, beyond the beyond. No, that's not what the scientists want to hear. Show me the signal. I can't. I reject your God. But this is what is happening in quantum physics. There is no signal. With a space pregnant sense, there is no signal. There is no signal. But the communication is there because the particles are behaving as if. There is communication. So we've got to admit for the first time in human history that there is something tangible that happened. And yet, this domain does not make any sense. Domain outside of space and time, which quantum mathematics was telling us, in which these waves of possibility move, which did not make any sense. So you are saying, well, this is all absurd, quantum physics is a little bit weird, nobody understands that aspect of quantum physics, all this wisdom will lead us. No, this is weird, but real, measurable, tangible. Because communication can be done through that domain of reality. How do we define domain outside of space and time? It's the domain in which no signal is required for communication. For the first time in human history, we are experiencing the existence of God. Experimental. Experimental. Every person who is prepared to face square his or her prejudice about the world can understand it. It's a little bit sophistication, I agree. I you know, sometimes I get challenged, well can you can you can you make a three year old understand? this concept. No, I can't. I tried. I went to uh, preschool children and I spoke to them. Nobody could understand. Gave up. So I don't know how much sophistication is required before you can understand these words that are saying to you. But in this audience, is there any exception? Cannot be. Look, if there is, Pick up and we'll deal with that. Okay? And we will do that in the, in, the, in the second hour where I'm going to be teachers. We'll do that. Right now, I'm just teasing you, and the tease is, is a tremendous tease. There is the domain here, space and time, in which we communicate through signals, which move to space and time a little bit at a time, and here is this. It's exactly, exactly like if you have gone into Egyptian uh, pictures of reality, you see that they draw a huge thing like this. <coughs> Here is communication between people out who are alive, and they have this picture of the uh, Egyptian picture of the dead, where the communication is outside of space and time, and they draw it like this. And that's one way of drawing this picture right now of quantum domain outside of space and time, domain for the waves, now we give it a name, domain of potentiality. We'll explain all that later. Just kidding you, remember? 
domain of space and time, domain of actuality, domain of manifestation, domain of stuff that we call real, but it's really so-called real. So-called real because there is another domain where no signal is needed, communication is instantaneous. What does that mean? If you and I don't require any signal to communicate, what does that mean? When is a time that you do not need a signal to communicate? Think about it. With yourself. Do you ever need a signal to communicate with yourself? You will start with us. Nobody can be done. So what is this domain then? This domain must be just that one thing. One without a second. Right? One without a second. Shankar is worth to come back and resonate with us in the form of quantum field. Isn't that wonderful? This guy lived so many years ago and he comprehended the other. One without a second. And quantum physics is saying this domain of potentiality is one without a second. That's it. One without a second. But this time, this time, we are doing it in such a way that this quantum object, you know, we are not lost. We are not lost thinking that this is only, this is it, this is reality and that's it. Why are we losing sight? Because we know that this is the waveness, but there is also the particle. See, quantum physics never lets us forget the other part. The problem with when we discover, you know, some of you have read Vivek Trump. It's a wonderful book, Press Jewel of Discrimination. It's really Press Jewel of Discrimination. Discrimination between reality and unreality. Asat and Sat. Right? And Shankar is exuberant. Beautiful passage. But a question as well as this. So, in his writing, there is some forgetfulness about the mundane world. My heart. Forget the mundane. Only get into the heart. Quantum physics don't allow us to do that. Quantum physics says, but these waves are waves of potentiality, waves of possibility. What would that mean? Figure it out. We will have to figure it out, and we will. This is a teaser. Possibility. Take possibility. Possibility, an object will be here, there. Possibility, an electron, which is a quantum object. That we hear, there, 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 there. Possibility. In possibility, I can be rich, I can be poor, I can be healthy, I can be sick. I can be bad, I can be good. Right? In possibility. And then quantum physics says, but when you measure them, you always find them to reveal themselves as particles, objects that we can measure. <coughs> what of physics never lets us forget that this world of potentiality becomes actuality in our experience as soon as we have measured them and experienced them. And this is the beauty of integrating the two spiritual and the material scientifically with the help of quantum physics. Look at what happened just now. I'm teasing, so you're not getting it full. That's the purpose of this whole lecture, to confuse it so that we can put you back to that. <laughs> but look at, when I say this, 
that there is this wave, this domain, which is completely interconnected. And this domain where we are seeing separateness, where we are seeing objects, just as we expect them, these solid objects, solid reality that I can measure, the reality that scientists love, and this reality which we cannot talk about, you know, many traditions, many spiritual traditions, the God is ineffable. We cannot talk about it. Don't talk, don't talk. Of course, we do talk. Even those people who say, don't talk, are talking. Quantum right? physics is giving us a hint of how to deal with that. By distinguishing, okay, this connection, this interconnectedness, this oneness, is all a characteristic of that. This separateness is a characteristic of this. The one can be experienced only as separate. One can be experienced only as separate. So that was this guy named Brahmakrishna, you know, many of them. So he had a he had a disciple named very clever disciple named Vivekananda. He became Vivekananda later, his name was Narendra actually. So this Narendra, Ramakrishna's favorite disciple, he became later, that he would come and, and tease Ramakrishna in the same way that I used to see, tease my friend. Show me God. Ramakrishna said, you know what? I see God in you. Of course, Lorenzo would not quite understand it, but if you were a quantum physicist, you would. You see, Ramakrishna knew that if I see God, it has to be in separate. How can I see God in you? That I can see very easily. How? When your little child, in the morning, you have fed her, and she's going to school, and she goes out, and you feel that there is an emptiness in your heart. What happens? What is happening? There was a connection, that connection is a little broken, and you are feeling it. So can you see God in your little child? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. So this is the reason that we have children, to remind us of that interconnection that we have, to with everyone, with everyone. In these four days, we will become intimate with each other like that. When the time to say goodbye will come two o'clock or so on Sunday afternoon, when we part to feel a little density in our heart. And we know that we have been together. We have experienced that oneness. We have cultivated that oneness. And now we have to separate again. So every, every day in living, we have the opportunity of experiencing the oneness. We know that it is there. When you start feeling it, then we are seeing God. When you start feeling it, then we are no longer oblivious of the sun. And this is the job of the quantum activist. Quantum activist leaves the truth of the quantum. The thinking, right thinking, the worldview tells us that yes, there is this domain where there is always connection, but somehow we are breaking that connection by living here in this reality. But this is as part and parcel, because that's the price we pay by having experiences. As soon as you experience this quantum physics, immediately we are separate. In this domain, there we separate. Shankar Samaya is imperfect. It is immediately imposed. The unity is no longer separate. But then, what, is the, what does the activist do? How does the activist use this knowledge that yes, there is unity underneath? 
the active is start living in a way that you need to no longer be here. In other words, activist discovers this little babies of the world that constantly is reminding us, yes, we are connected. Activists prepare on psychology, activists can present it in economics that certainly on energy, that is called vital energy or vitality, activists prepare on those things to constantly remind it, I'm connected, I'm connected, I'm not going to do things which shows that I'm really separate, because I'm not. So living as a quantum activist is to constantly have that double existence. To live like the ancient Baals used to think. We live in the world. We bathe in the water. But we don't get wet. Beautiful man. We live in the world, we bathe in the worldly stream of worldly sufferings and separatenesses and all that stuff. You know, we become angry with others and sometimes to bother and crazy things. But can we do it always remembering that I am connected? I am connected. I am connected by that quantum domain of potentiality. I'm connected that by that one. That's what the activist is doing. That's what being a quantum activist means. So it is also the kind of livelihood that allows us to have that one word oneness of earth all the time. There are livelihood that allows us to do that. The Bhagavad Gita was created with the idea, very wonderful idea, that any, any service, any service that we do can be used like that. But today we are a little more practical. Bhagavad Gita was written by extreme idealists. And this is why the ancient teachings did not penetrate very far. It's too much of an idealism to think that you can steal from others and still remember the connection. Extreme idealism. I have never seen a stealer who remembered that you are connected. If you are connected, if you remember it, you cannot steal. Try it. I don't think you can. As soon as you remember that this fellow is connected to me, how can you steal? You are stealing from yourself. So certain ways of, of doing things that are common in our society, for example, in India we take bribes quite openly. Without bribes you cannot get things done in India. These things would be possible if we knew that you are driving yourself. It's a game that we play. Totally unnecessary. Why not pay the fellows? We know already, we know already that they cannot survive with such dominations as people can in those positions. Simple solution to complete people. Why don't we just acknowledge that they need the money, pay them work. They have the power of using their job as a source of primary, why not just acknowledge that this, this job attracts bribery, so we might as well pay them money so that they don't need to bribe and teach them to be wise so that they see that accepting bribery is against their nature. They have to, in other words, wake up to their stuff and their children today. Why is it this way right now more than ever? Because before we had the spiritual tradition that was giving us a reminder that look, this is wrong. We call it ethics. This is wrong. <coughs> but we use the ethics in the wrong way. It's very funny. 
How did you use the ethics? We said that the ethical order. God will punish you by sending you to hell. Why is this a problem? Why is this antithetical? Because you are imposing fear to do something which is good. Fear, is that a good emotion? Everybody can recognize no it is it's what we call a negative emotion. It's keeping us away, it's keeping us separate. Whereas not accepting bribe is an acknowledgement of the oneness to why you're cheating. You're cheating yourself, right? So you cannot at once be fearful, which says separateness. And you it says you are not separate. You cannot do that. So ethics, the way it has been insisted, implied, um, Used in all traditions, East and West, has always had this strong way of approaching it. Means and ends are not in simple, are not congruent. And this is the problem with, with quantum physics. This kind of incongruent, this kind of lack of synchrony is the most something can come. So this four day, you will go through lots of practices to show you how to do it. But never forget that this incongruence will not go away until we recognize from fundamental core of our being that unless we make right livelihood as part of the society that we live, we are never going to be able to live quantum way, integrated way. Yes. If we live in a society in which I have to be bright, I cannot serve unity. So we have to change the society also. This is imperative to understand. Knowing the truth is good. But knowing the truth as a renunciate, as the only thing, to think that way is wrong. Why is it wrong? Because we are not ready. Can you really be a renunciate? If you are ready, by all means, quantum physics does not tell you to live in the world if you are ready to be unsure. But recognize, are you ready? Are you ready? And if the answer comes that no, I am not ready because I want to teach, do you know how it becomes, becomes clear to me every day, the reminder? Why am I not ready? I know every day that I'm not ready because I love what I'm doing right now. I'm teaching you, I'm going to do a photo workshop, and I have such collaborators, and you are going to understand, and you are going to get enthused, and you are going to get a taste of what life can give you, and that gives me such wonderful joy. And I'm attached to that joy. That's why I'm not ready. to be lovely, ask yourself the question that, okay, you know, we don't have to change the world if we are ready to live in isolation, if we are ready to give up. We don't share the world. If you don't need anything, if you don't feel attachment to that joy that comes in relationship, in helping people, in loving people, then you are there. If you are not ready, however, there is only one way to live, which is to change the world as you like to see the world to be. What world do I want to live? I want to live in a world where everybody feels this love that I feel for you. I want to live in a world where everybody is authentic. 
I want to live in a world where everybody recognizes that both spirit and matter is important. I want to live in a world where everybody is aware that we are born with some violent tendencies built into our brain, but we are ready to balance and integrate, harmonize those negative emotional stuff in our brain. That's the world that I want to create. That's the world that I want you to co-create with me. And this is what what I'm to do with that. This is why walking our path as we register so beautifully is so important. We walk our path by trying to take this message that look, we have found the way to live. You know, it's wonderful to be a Rishi of the Upanishad. I've seen the unity behind the darkness. Hear ye, hear ye, all you sons and daughters of the Mahatma. I've seen the red Purusha beyond all this darkness. But what is the Rishi doing? He's giving the message, he's bringing the message to us. The Rishi of the Upanishad knew that the ultimate message has to be given to everybody. The world must be changed. Same thing with Mahayana Buddhism. We cannot just have a small vehicle which takes us and drink the nectar of immortality, but we must also share it with the rest of the world. We must change the world too. So if quantum activism is about changing yourself, with this wonderful knowledge that quantum physics has, wonderful integration that quantum physics achieves, and bring it to the world, that strong the world of jobs, world of occupation. Can a karma really, you know, make karma keep alive today in the 21st century world? Can a farmer, agriculture, doing agriculture, really live in the unity? We have to ask this question, how? We have to change the nature of farming for green that. Not the way that we have done it traditionally, that there is a landlord and farmer is just serving this landlord and following his or her rules. No, that does not make it conducive to finding the spirit in farming a piece of land. But there is a way of farming a piece of land which will constantly teach me about the unity of everything. This is what we are saying. There is a way of transforming the profession because all human professions were created because particular people are suited for following particular archetypes. Show me a job and I'll show you an archetype that we, that we can investigate by doing that profession. Every one of them, scientists, investigates the archetype of truth. If you don't follow the archetype of truth in science, you become unhappy. I was one of them. Can it be done? That gives you happiness? Yes, of course. But we may have to change the profession in a fundamental way. The way the profession is practiced today, the profession of the scientist, it's impossible. Same thing is true of the lawyer, same thing is true of the politician, same thing is true of the business person. We have to change the way business is done before we can demand that let the business person be ethical business person, creative business person. So it's our responsibility to change the way the professions have been denigrated professions discarded, corrupted. We cannot say, well, no, that's not our job. This has been one of the big problems with spiritual tradition. Well, in a way, that is true. That's the big confusion. In what way is it true? Well, movement of consciousness. What we forget, though, is that what we are doing, activism, this is also movement of consciousness. See? So if, if somebody who is completely detached, only then you can say movement of consciousness will take place and it will always satisfy it eventually. It's completely correct for only 
only if you are completely detached from it, if you are a renunciate. But when you become hypocrites, it's when you live in the world, and then you say movement of consciousness will take care of it anyway, and we don't have to do anything. No, that is not. If you live in the world, you ask yourself, why am I not living in unity? Why am I not happy? Why am I not realizing my potential? As soon as you ask that, you will see that, well, because I do a job which does not give me meaning and purpose, because I don't have the right knowledge, and because I don't live in the right way. Then you ask yourself, okay, can I bring meaning and purpose in my life? Can I realize my potentiality? As soon as you do that, you become a quarter right. There is no other way. So welcome to quantum activism, a life of fullness, life of wonder, life of huge satisfaction. Thank you. We'll take a brief break, right? We are ready for a break? We'll take a brief break. But please, uh, what is our time for the break? Half an hour? Half an hour? Why is it important to pronounce it correctly? Because that reminds us that if you do this yoga correctly, the wisdom will come to you. Now, the previous time, when Shankara, or the great Shankaracharya, taught ekam eva adityam, one without a second, People would take very long time to comprehend it. So after I finished, a few of you came and asked, what is this coming of this year? What does it mean? Good question. Stay with it. In the olden days, we used to say that stay with it, stay with it, stay with it, until even Ramana Maharshi, who was a great sage, living in Tiruvannamala, not very far from here. Uh, his idea of getting the knowledge was, okay, ask the question, who am I? Who the hell am I? You used you the word hell, but I put it in. <laughs> but who am I? Who am I will? That's another way of asking the question. And they would go on and on and on and on, Describe in various ways and wait and wait and wait and wait. But people would never get it. How Ramana got it is interesting by itself. He just lay down on the ground. We are 16 years old, you know, at 16 we do wild things. So he did something very wild. He felt that if he lies down, if he pretends to be dead, then his physical body is gone, right? So at least you will find out who is he beyond his physical body. So imagine Ramana is lying down, physical body is dead. Thought comes to him, but mind is still very active. He says, let's kill the mental body. So he kills the mental body. No thinking. On and on he goes. Sixteen year old. That kind of age, you are very innocent, you can do this thing. But of course, there are more tricks here. My scientist interpretation of this story is that Ramana is no ordinary kid. This is a kid that goes, has gone on through these many incarnations and therefore he already knew the trick. And that's why he could do it. It's just triggering. But let's hear the story. There is wisdom here. The same story is told in the Upanishad. So he goes on like this. He kills the mind. He kills the vital energies, feeling. He kills what is next called the Gana Mayakosha, the, the source, that body in us from which Jnana itself comes. 
they kill that child. Then finally, there is a source of our experience that in the Upanishad is called a source of bliss. Ananda Mayokosha. Ananda. Ananda means unbounded, limitless, less in us. Limitlessness in us. How does that reveal? When you are limitless, you get an experience of total happiness. See, unhappiness comes from separate. Right? That's easy to understand. I'm angry at you. Why do I feel unhappy? Because I'm separate from you. I'm in love with you. Why am I happy? Because I'm in you. Easy to understand, right? So if that kind of seamlessness loving everyone enters in us, that too is experienced as a wonderful happiness, bliss. Okay? But then that bliss itself is still an experience, right? It is still an experience. And this is domain of potentiality. This is not experience. They didn't have the word, these mystics. Ramana did not know about quantum physics. I'm not saying that. But she knew intuitively that even the bliss is an experience and therefore separateness is already implicit. And when you realize that, it was perfection entered. It was awakened. It was enlightened. He had the ultimate wisdom. And after that, all he did was to do further sadhana to embody that wisdom, which he did certainly, and he lived and lived and taught that wisdom only by his presence. Talking very little, but in his presence, people would be happy. This is one of our models of existent being. With quantum activism, with quantum wisdom, I claim, this is why we are building a university, that we can teach people, we can make Ramana in our midst. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. You will see how easy today it is to attain this wisdom that I am connected, I am connected, I am one with one. My separateness is an illusion. The maya is not a maya of the world. Maya is not a maya of triviality of the world. That's not what maya is about. Maya is the unreality of the separateness. The separateness that we feel with each other, that we sense with each other, that we think with each other, that we even intuit with each other, that is the, that is what is trivial. If we go beyond that triviality, we find the oneness. So how can we do it? How we find this oneness by simple words, by simple talking about experiments and talking about what to physics? Well, that's up to you. This is why you have to go do one. What's different? What's different from the other days? What's different from Ramana's experience? Well, Ramana had only his experience to live through. So he penetrated layer by layer the camouflage. Camouflage meaning the layers of ignorance that enter, that makes us separate. So these are these things, Shankara gets the name of kosha. They are layers of coverings that separate. So today, similarly, we will remove these coverings of separateness by looking at the nature of these bodies, nature of these beings that we have that brings us experience. Okay? And we'll get the idea Jnana, the wisdom, that we are not separate with the help of another ingredient of this, which is experimental data. 
Ramana is doing it at experience, we'll do it with experience. Let's first go through the ignorance that has been created today by what we call scientific materialism. Why the word scientific materialism? Materialism is the idea that material is everything, material pleasures are everything, so we emphasize the material aspects of life. That's materialism. This is not scientific. When it becomes scientific, we say everything that we do coming from the material world. Everything that we experience, thinking, feeling, whatever have you, God, to so scientific materialist, God is nothing but a circuit in the brain. They write books about it and they sell millions of copies of these books. Really. And are they wrong? No, 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 absolutely not. Don't misunderstand me. There is a circuit in the brain which, if excited, will make you feel kind of connected. What we call a spiritual experience. How does that happen? Well, brain does have a, an evolutionary history. And that evolutionary history has produced many brain circuits. Some of them are very violent. They call those negative emotions. I'm angry at you, I'm jealous of you, I'm envious of you, and all that stuff. But some of them are also good, like this God in the brain. This is what they call it, God in the brain. I call it the G-spot. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be a little careful, this is an Indian argument. But this is a sophisticated idea of it, right? You don't mind the connotations. Okay. So, um, no, the G spot is not everything. I mean, there is a God spot in the brain, and it does excite, when excited, it does give us kind of a spiritual experience, but obviously that's not it. Why is that not it? Because um, it does not enable you to take it any further than that experience. It does not enable you to enact your godness when you need it. In other words, anger is arising. You cannot immediately go to your god spot to balance the anger. Okay, so what good is something if it cannot do what it is supposed to do? God is supposed to bring us peace, love, when anger is arising. Not when anger is gone and you are sitting and then you feel this wonderful experience. No, not like that. When you need it, when you are distressed, we say God's name. Our hope is that saying God's name will take us away from this anger, will save me from the anger, right? If it, if it doesn't do that, if by saying God's name, God's thought is not activated, it's no good. And only certain rituals will activate the God spot. We know those rituals too. Hindus have plenty of rituals that gives us this God spot. This is why we have the celebrations of Durga Puja. When you do puja, we sit like this, Om God spot. Immediately. That feeling that you are having of unity is like the God spot. No, don't misunderstand it. Even with all powerful mantra, no denying it. But it's not denigration. I'm not being a hidden by saying that what you're getting is the God's power. You're not getting God. Om is not an entry point to God. Please, and you must understand that and accept it. Wonderful mantra as it is, but all it leads to is a ritual for reaching certain brains. That is helpful, but not, is not that, is not that, is not that one, okay? So what is that one? If we think like this, then we'll never find that one. Because that one is not mechanistic like this. This is, this is Newton's construction 
of the reality. Everything is mechanical. Why did scientists do it this way? Because at that time, scientists, many people, good-minded people, seekers of truth, they really got sick and tired of the Christian church, which has, has been telling them what to do. For centuries, church has done that in the West and brought what really was a life of mystery. In those days, you know, you have to think like the days of the Mughal Empire um, in India to think of these people, you know, this is like 16th, 17th century. And uh, really, uh, India was affluent at that time and the West was full of misery. And therefore, the scientists blamed it all on the church and not wrongfully. And they uh, rebuilt. Now, from that rebellion came this concept. So it's not like that at all. God is not the one who determines reality. We, our knowledge, have power and we can change in the natural world to suit us. And if everything is material, then scientists can control, they can predict, and the world will be good. And for a while, the world was good. In the 18th century, we had industrial revolution, wonderful things happened, electricity came, and life changed in the West, and gradually that spread and spread. And now everybody's convinced that it's good, it's good, it's good. But now, it, more and more, it's turning out that no, it's not so good. It also brought us huge pollution, and you cannot sustain this affluent. You know, here in Bangalore, we live with constant reminder, you know, that the happiness that comes from electricity is only temporary. <laughs> only until our power, power plants are working. <laughs> when the electricity stops, perspiration is back. We no longer have the air conditioning, right? And Indians are reminded of that. It's a good thing, too. In the West, it's so much forgotten, all miseries can so much hidden under the carpet as they say, that they forget that there is suffering. If there is suffering, there is always shopping. I can go buy myself something and that will forget me, make me forget the suffering. So by and large, this idea that life of separateness is suffering can be avoided. So nobody much is aware that there is another way to live, find the unity and cultivate the unity within us. And that's a better way in some sense because the uh, cessation of suffering that you get from the pleasures is temporary. And if you don't see that and try to make more and more pleasures, Eventually, the body gives up. Body just gives up, body quits. And so what has happened in the West is that people have lots of pleasure from a variety of source, drugs especially, of various kinds, but then when you grow old, you live a miserable last few months, and that's when all the suffering that you postpone, they come back in piles and piles and piles. So last days of living a life of pleasure is very, very unpleasurable. Anyway, that still, that still cannot stop us from having pleasure as an escape. But this escape is totally unnecessary because the worldview is now very clear. It's not a mechanical universe, as Newton thought. As I said, quantum physics, the idea of quantum, that objects are both wave and particle, this idea is the liberty idea. So let's try to understand why we say that the waves live in a domain called domain of potentiality. Why don't these waves live in space and time? Why is the mathematics telling us that we know they have got to live in a different domain than space and time? Okay. So that's our first exercise. So listen to me carefully. 
Wave is something that spreads out, right? That is the distinction. Wave cannot stay at the place where you first released it. If a quantum object is released, it's a wave, so it must spread. Spread, spread, spread all over the room. Yeah? Imagine electron all over the room. Imagine that you set up a grid, three-dimensional grid of Geiger counters in this room. Geiger counter, Geiger counter, Geiger counter, Geiger counter, counter. everywhere. Three-dimensional grid of Geiger counters. Our first ex ex uh, when our first exposition happens, you know, when you take the quantum course, the first grade in school, teacher has said that. And indeed, I imagine, oh, all this guy around just going tick, tick, tick. Really, that's what you think, because the electron is everywhere in the Teacher has said so. The equation is telling you that. But guess what? Next thing the teacher says, but of course we all know, and indeed, you think about it, we do not, we do not hear every bag counter in the room go tick, tick, tick. Instead, only one of them ticks. This is the mystery. Only one bag counter ticks. A whole room full of them. Electron is everywhere. That's what the theory says. Electron is everywhere in this room. And yet, experience shows, the experiment shows, that in a given experiment, only one of the Geiger counter will tick. So that's the one which is getting the electron manifest right there in that position where the Geiger counter is. Why is that? This is the question. Why is that is one question. Now that question will lead us to deep wisdom. But even before that we ask, okay, so what is happening here? When we hear the tip, certainly the electron is actualized. No question. So before that, how was it that the electron was everywhere? So we say, ah, electron was everywhere, but in possibility, only as potentiality. Not actuality. That's why we didn't hear everywhere Geiger counters go tick, tick, tick. So we bring out the conceptual understanding of this thought experiment, that electrons are everywhere. Electron is a wave only as a wave of potentiality, wave of possibility. These waves are not real waves in space and time. Okay? Everybody clear on this? They are waves of potentiality. So it immediately becomes clear, ah, they must live in a domain which is also a domain of Potentiality. Potentiality. We must call this the domain of potentiality. Of course, all kinds of things are going in your head. Most important one of them is that is this domain real. Now remember, you may remember. Remember, big prejudice here is potentiality real. Big prejudice here is potentiality real. And what is reality? We have to understand some things here. From basic, these are basic questions. What is reality? What is reality? We have a prejudice. No, we have a prejudice. This land is reality. We call it real estate in English. Estate is real. It's bad. Real estate. Is this domain of potentiality real? This is the kind of question that it is just asked immediately. But calling it the domain of potentiality, calling it the waves, waves of possibility helps enormously in understanding what is going on. Right? Before then people thought that the waves are waves in space and time. They thought that the waves are when you put a Geiger counter to measure them. The waves collapse in space and time like a collapsing umbrella. So this change of potentiality into actuality, physicists still use the word collapse. The waves collapse. But collapse how? Like an umbrella? 
No, obviously it cannot be, because collapse is instantaneous. As soon as you have put the Geiger counter, immediately we find the electron. We don't have to wait. But remember relativity, every wave has to move the finite speed, everything in space and time has to move the finite speed, and therefore there should have been a little time elapsed, but no time elapses. Theory is very clear on that. The waves instantaneously become part. So it became very clear that this collapse of the wave is not a collapse through space and time. How is it taking place then? It's an instantaneous collapse. Okay. Something we never thought, never believed, that anything can be instantaneous. Anything in space and time obviously cannot be instantaneous because Einstein proved relativity or speed is always finite. It can be very high speed. The speed of light is very, very high, 186,000 miles per second. Three times 10 to the 8 centimeters per second, huge, 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 huge. Uh, three times 10 to the 8 centimeters per second, huge, huge numbers. But still, it's a finite number. Nothing can move faster than the speed of light. That's the wisdom of theory of relativity, verified by many, many, many experimental data. So nobody can doubt this kind of wisdom. And then we are forced to the conclusion that okay, this domain got to be outside of space and time. Because obviously things move with infinite speed here. Communication takes place with our signals here, outside of space and time. Okay. How do you feel? Confused. This is, yes. Confused. I'm only confused. <laughs> okay, please express your confusion. Yes. Uh, it's possible. I mean, I know you gave one example of a room and uh, electron and guided counter. Can you give a second uh, example, maybe in terms of the basketball that we showed in what the field we know? Okay. Just try to do that. Good, good thing. Some examples. of you, how many of you have seen this movie? What the clip do we know? Some of you have seen. We tried to, the filmmakers, I should say. Yeah, good. Now, next time. Anybody ask questions, you take the microphone. That will make it easier for everybody to hear it. Uh, so, uh, how do you show that the electron is everywhere in the room? I'd love to have a genuine, unconfusing picture of this, but there is no way to show it without little confusion. So, what we try to do is that, you know, the job of the basketball, as you know, have played basketball. The job of every basketball player is to throw the ball in such a way that it falls to the hoop. That's the actuality we want to create. So there is a scene in the movie where the filmmakers created basketball being thrown at the basket but they're falling all places. So that's the possibility. And then the actuality is when it falls right into the hoop. Okay, so it's a metaphor though. Because in reality, potentiality is not actuality. So whenever you show a basketball, it's already actuality. But how do you show potentiality to basketball? So what we should have done is, well, if, if I were the movie maker, I would not have used basketball. I, used, I would have used both basketballs. Okay? You see the difference? Instead of basketball, we should have shown shadow basketballs falling into the, but they're, they're imaginary basketball, ghost basketball. And then the actual basketball is created when we're seeing that basketball fall to the hoop. So let's try to try to do this. Let's try to do this. I mean, this is the part you have to understand. So what is this? I ask you, what is this that I'm holding? Please. Uh, no, 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 keep the names different. Potentiality is, call it reality. Potentiality is reality, because that's all there is. Okay, potentiality is reality. But when we, we are creating or manifesting or actualizing, why is, when, a, when we put it out there, when we put out the possibility there, then shift, it, it uh, doesn't 
actualize instantly or it doesn't actualize. So what is that gap? So what is the magic of actualizing it? Yes. Okay, that takes the question deeper. That's the question we really would like to understand. What is this magic that brings potentiality into actuality? But let's postpone that a little bit. Let's understand the difference clearly. There is potentiality, and potentialities are many, many facets, right? Basketball can fall anywhere. That's the potentiality. I throw the basketball, right? It can fall anywhere. Usually, if I throw it, almost never it will fall to the floor. Almost always it will fall somewhere outside, right? But of course, sometimes it does fall to the hook, and that's what we call actuality. So people, people felt initially that, yeah, it's all by chance, right? It's all by chance, just like you throw basketball, I'm novice. By chance, once in a while, it will fall to the hook. So by chance, once in a while, it will fall at a Geiger counter, or another Geiger counter, or another Geiger counter, right? It's all chancy. And that kind of thing shows up. All by chance. You can calculate the probability of hitting the hoop. So these probabilities are plotted, and they make, indeed, a plot that we are very familiar with if you have studied statistics. Indeed, this is called the bell curve, and the expectation is that within this bell curve, the possibilities will come with certain probabilities, and these probabilities can be calculated with the help of the quantum mathematics. Okay? It, it assumes that there has to be some activity happening beyond the space and time, and that is creating the reality. Okay, you are going on to the right question. But is this clear that we have potentiality, many facets? Yes. And then actuality. What he is saying is that this chance description does not satisfy. Chance description is a good description. And it holds for large number of events. When we have measured large number of events, indeed, the chance description that there is a probability that we can calculate of where the electron will go, or if this particular basket or will fall through the hoop or not. And you can calculate those probabilities, and certainly can take pride that, oh, we can calculate the average result of an experiment, wonderful. But he's saying, but in a single experiment, we can do that too. In a single experiment, here is this electron, possibility, potentiality to be anywhere in this room. Can I ever predict that this particular Geiger counter will be the one that will take? No, quantum physics does not have the capacity. Then he's saying, then what does it? What does it? It must fall in one particular Geiger counter, not this one, not that one, but maybe in this one. But who chose that? Right on. Right on. That's the question. That's the question. So we say that's the question of quantum measurement. Who decides the measurement? Who decides the outcome? Or what decides the outcome if you don't like the word who? Scientists hate the word who because that brings subjectivity inside. They don't like subjectivity. From Newton's time, we have been very objective. It's important to be objective, right? That should not depend on the observer. should not depend on your personal will. You may have a prejudice. You like that corner of the room better than this corner, right? So they don't like that subjectivity <coughs> to enter into what defines the actuality. Very legitimate from their point of view. So what does quantum physics say about that? This is the question that you have to decipher eventually. But very, very important is the idea that we create reality, or reality is created. If we give in to the scientists, okay, your concern is legitimate, let's use passive voice until we become very clear that there is a who that creates. But you have to be very clear on that before we give up on objectivity. So, okay, so 
We'll postpone the discussion until we are understanding the situation completely, which is that there are many, many possibilities. And it is true that we have one particular measurement, only one of these possibilities become actuality. Not all of them simultaneously. It's not that electron is smeared all over the room. It's not like that at all. In other words, potentialities do not look like actuality. This is the first mistake you make. Like it's not that basket of falling all over the court and then all of a sudden something goes to the hook. It's not like that. There is no basketball falling anywhere. It's all potentiality. Okay? It's all potentiality. Huge prejudice centers here. Don't be, don't be bashful. Don't be bashful. Question. Please. You are interchangeably using or there is a discriminatory use of the word potentiality, probability, and... Uh, use, use the microphone. That, that will make it easier. Phone. Microphone. Somebody has to do a lot of running around. No problem. It's an exercise. I can come and speak louder. Here. Yeah, save, you can. If you yeah. Save your good, 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 good. Yeah. So you using you using three words here. Yeah, which is potentiality, probability, and actuality. Actuality. Possibility. Possibility. Yeah. So are these Potentiality and possibility are the same. Yeah, exactly. I want to know if they are the same or they are different. They are the same. Right. <coughs> okay. So can you, you tell me what is, what is reality yeah. defined? Just this minute. Okay. Reality, actuality, potentiality, and probability. See, there are so okay. many things. Pro probability, let's leave that one out. Probability is very clear. It's just a mathematical concept. If you do many, many cases, we can calculate the probability of a particular case taking place, right? Probability in this room, we have many people of many different ages, but there is a certain probability.